This is Dance Studio 411, where we answer your real life questions about your toughest studio life predicaments parent problems, teacher turnover, student challenges, policy dilemmas, and so much more. Let's talk about what's keeping you awake at night and what you can do about it. Here are your hosts, Suzanne Blake Garrity and Jill Tyrone. everyone. Welcome to this episode of our Dance Studio 411 podcast. Our special guest today is Katie Groven, founder of Dancer Fitness. She is going to talk to us today about some safe dancing and stretching tips for our students that are dancing at home right now, as well as provide some insight into ways to prevent injuries when we do, in fact, look forward to coming back to our regular in-studio classes. So welcome, Katie. So yeah, I'm Katie Groven, and I am a ACSM certified personal trainer, and I'm also a holistic health coach with 25 years of dance experience, and I coached for 10 of them. I'm a world champion hip-hop dancer, and um, when I got pregnant with my daughter Hazel, I was traveling the country training dancers on, you know, strength training, and then educating their coaches and teachers on how to incorporate strength training into their, their curriculum. Because it's something that it doesn't get a lot of um, attention all the time. It is now. People are really respecting dancers as athletes. And as I was nine months pregnant doing burpees, I was like, I have to find a different way to continue to teach and educate. So I created dancerfitness.com, which is an online exercise database. And it's designed exclusively for dancers. So no one has to Google. No one has to go on Pinterest. You know where you're going to get your your fitness. Um, And with all my dancing experience and my personal training experience, I'm really glad I was able to combine those two things into a really helpful resource that is very much needed right now totally and and especially with what's what's going on in the world and everyone being at home training having a resource where you don't have to second guess is um, I think has been really helpful and I've been getting a lot of great feedback from from that as well exactly well and and it's great to have you here today because I know um, that the dance fitness, like, as you said, you, you're solving a problem, which is so many dancers in the past weren't necessarily viewed with their athleticism part. And now they're getting more respect that way. But there's also kids or even dance teachers, they'll see stuff on the internet and think, oh, that's how it should go, but they're not doing it safely or, um, in the proper form. I mean, you know, so much how proper form I want I do want to go back and hear about your world hip hop dance. <laughs> experience. Um, that's amazing. Can you give us just a little background? Like, where did you grow up dancing? Sure. So I, we were born in Maryland, um, and then we moved to Illinois, and then we moved to Minnesota here. And when we were, when we moved to Minnesota, I was strictly doing ballet, and I danced at the Minnesota Dance Theater. And when I was about 15, I decided I want to try something else because I was not built for ballet as I, that's what I believed at the time. There's so many different um, body shapes and sizes that are celebrated now in ballet and in all of the dance industry. And so I joined my high school dance team. And after that, I danced at the University of St. Thomas. I started their dance club because I um, chickened out of auditioning for the actual team itself. And then also I did... um, the an international open program called existence and that was great because we got to go to the world championships in florida you see a lot of cheer teams go to the world championships as well they call it worlds Mm -hmm. and we won in 2011 and 2014 with our hip-hop routine which was incredible because we were all in our late 20s early 30s competing against 14 year olds and we won and so it was really it was a great testament to um you know continuing to train and take care of yourself and you can continue to dance until you're like quote unquote old if you want to and still and still do really well so that was great and i retired from all of that um about four years ago when i was getting married and, and then having two babies, I just haven't gotten back into it yet, but it was a really fun experience. That's awesome. Well, I know so many of our listeners, if they've started out as studio owners on the younger side, many are going through that transition of having their children and growing their family. So let's dive in then today, you know, to give our, the listeners, whether they're teachers or studio owners or both or, or serving, you know, a wide variety of children at their studio or to adult dancers, you know, what are some tips you have for everyone given the circumstances that we're all dancing in our living rooms and maybe trying to get, stay in shape? I mean, I saw someone on our um, member group the other day, they're like, I'm so worried that these kids are going to come back completely lost everything, you know, like all of their technique, all of their strength and conditioning. So 
Any tips? Sure. Well, at first, I just want to celebrate the, the teachers and coaches who are having their dancers continue to train at home. This is a great opportunity to increase their strength, their endurance, but even more importantly, is to balance out their dancers' weak side. When we have the same choreography that we're doing over and over again, or we're only turning on the right, or maybe we do our turns on the left a couple times, that side of the body that's our weaker side or the side that's not getting used, that's more prone to injury. So this is a great opportunity to have your dancers do things called unilateral exercises, something like a lunge, where one foot is in front of the other, or doing one leg balances. Um, doing exercises one side and then the other side so that both sides get this attention that's really missing. Plus, the more that they're strength training outside of here, injury prevention is, gonna, is going to increase that way as well. Things they can use, they can put uh, books into a backpack and hold onto their backpack and they can do squats, they can walk their stairs, they can do walking lunges, they can do going from a lunge into a passe and then up onto releve, so it's another good unilateral one. If they're doing any type of core work, I highly recommend planking. Crunching builds the abdominal wall outward. Twisting builds the abdominal walls sideways. We want dancers to work on pulling their core in, rib cage down, and the great thing about planking is you can do a very simple plank and it's very effective. But if you want to go into that unilateral again, while you're planking, you can extend one leg forward and one leg back, lift them off the floor. Now we're working ankles, we're working quads, shoulders. So you're getting a full body workout from a simple movement. You're strengthening both sides individually. And then we're also mimicking what dancers need to do on the floor. They need to be able to breathe, but engage their core, rib cage down, and move their arms and legs. So I would definitely recommend a plank with extending an arm, extending a leg, and then those unilateral exercises. And if they're working on their upper body, like push-ups, they can do that on a coffee table, they can do it on a counter, so many options. And if they want any type of weights um, for their arms, they can do kitty litter, um, detergent, bottles of water. There's so many options at home for them to use. Yeah, this is definitely, um, this whole experience of being stay at home for to be safer at home is causing us to get very creative on apparatus and um, things that we can use around the house. Um, those are good tips, the backpack with the books to add some extra weight. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, lifting, like you said, simple things like bottles of water, you don't think of it, but it, it, it works, you know? It does. It does. And if they're going to prioritize any muscles, if they're like talking to their students and they're saying, you need to work on these three muscles, um, I did this with my hand. <laughs> these three muscles, um, they're glute muscles, which are their butt muscles, um, their ankles, and their core. That's, That's where I would focus. And so many times those glute muscles, the butt muscles, don't get the attention they need. So then what happens is our hamstrings take over, our low back takes over, and then our hips take over and we get injured. So All really right, so work the glutes, work the glutes, very simple things like laying on your back and doing a hip bridge and lifting your butt up into the air and bringing it back down. Um, 20 of those three times through, you'll start feeling the burn. And if you want a little bit of a challenge, you can lay on your back and place your feet on your bottom step and then do the same thing. Lift your glutes off the floor, squeeze at the top and come back down. That's awesome. So glutes, ankles, core, strengthening from home. And then I guess my thought for you, Katie, is, you know, some, some of the things that we're noticing with our dance teachers reporting out that, you know, they're, they're sad because they can't, you can't make those corrections. It's hard to make a correction from a video. So, you know, is this, how does a dancer learn to self-correct? Like what are some tips that you learn to, to self-regulate your own body to do this without injury? I think that's a really great question. And it's kind of um, a circle here because when you strength train, you become more aware of your body. But I would say number one is if you feel any pinching in your low back, you're doing something wrong. So whether you're on your back and lifting your hips, it means your hips are too high. If you're squatting, it means that you're not holding your core. If you're planking and you feel your low back, um, tension in your low back, it means that you've let go of your core as well and you're sinking. So definitely low back. And then mostly, most things can be solved by simply squeezing the core and squeezing the glutes. So I would have their dancers, if they feel like something's not quite right, or just to be really mindful of pull the tummy in, rib cage down, and squeeze the glutes. And when people, when I tell people about engaging the glutes, I, it sounds so silly, but it works. I tell them to pretend like they're holding in a fart. <laughs> because it, it, know, makes, it works. It makes sense and people get it. Um, so that's what I would recommend for that. And always just checking themselves just as when they're dancing. Are my shoulders down? Is my rib cage down? Am I still breathing? Um, simple things like that. 
Exactly. Well, it's, it's such a weird phenomenon, right? We're having these kids dance in their whatever living room, bedroom, wherever they can find space, and they don't have a mirror to re- give them feedback, but they have this immediate video back, which mm-hmm. is a whole... So, um, you know, the kids are doing their best. I think that kind of leads into... We had, you know, we're dance teachers and we're... So we have high expectations and we like, our job is to try it again, run it again, to keep getting better. And now suddenly our expectation of what's a successful day has been reimagined. So I guess the question is, you know, how do you, how do we, or what are some tips you would think to keep kids motivated to do this training? Like what's some motivational tips that you found throughout the years to keep people Going. Sure. I, I think for sure motivation comes from within. So having dancers identify their own goals. I don't think dancers have identified quite yet that when they strength train, it increases the consistency of their skills. So I think a lot of dancers are motivated by, I really want to get a triple or a quad, or I really want to hit this um, you know full split leap. Coming up with a skill that they really want to master and then reverse engineering, which exercises are going to help with that. Um, And that, um, you know, not to like plug, but on the website on dancerfitness.com, you can filter the exercises by the skill you'd like to improve on. So Uh that will help them identify, identify some of those. So deciding on a goal, the other, and exercises that'll help that. The other one is doing challenges within the studio, right? Planking challenges, squatting challenges, push-up challenges, um, getting them competitive with one another. Those are those are probably the two most motivating factors is competing against somebody else and then figuring out that you can become a stronger and more consistent dancer with strength training. Yeah. I like that because it, we've, it, again, this is, everyone's navigating new and we've never even considered how to keep people motivated virtually. And when we remove the, t- the, the group experience, which in itself is motivating, right? So when you, like you said, how do you create the positive group motivation, even though they're working, like maybe that you do a challenge, but you make it still be fun for them as a unit. Cause you work with a lot of dance teams, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so, you know, you've, you've been on a world championship team yourself. Um, you know, this kind of, I guess goes into a lot of mind over matter. I mean, you've obviously had to overcome a lot of mind over matter moments to be, get to be at that level. Have you noticed anything through this work you've done through creating this website or with the work you've done with teachers that like, what is like a mental hack or something you, you lean on personally that you think has made you successful? Mm. That's a really great question. I is it like the self-talk? Like, do you give yourself a little pep talk before you're getting ready to work out? Like, what are some of your things? You <laughs> that's, that's very hard now with two little kiddos. Right. Um, it, it's picturing where I want to go, picturing what I want to see. You know, they say like dress for the job you want, not the job you have. And um, I truly believe that what you think and, and what you believe, that's going to become your reality. So visualizing where I want to be, um, how I want a certain skill to look, how strong I want to feel. That was a great thing when I got into powerlifting, being able to squat 200 and something pounds. That was super empowering. Um, so being able to think back on a moment or, or look forward into um, where you want to be, how you want to feel. I think every dancer has had a moment where they've nailed a skill or they, or even um, dance educators, teachers have had a moment where they've seen their team win. Mm -hmm. That moment, that feeling, feel that again and see what you need to do to move forward that way. What do you envision? I mean, none of us knows what re-entry is going to look like, but being the expert you are on fitness and dance, what are some of the considerations we might need to think about to bring kids back into the classroom again? Cause we can't pick up where we left off without concerns of injury or like, you know, what are some things you've noticed if I almost akin this to like, if someone was coming back from an injury, like where they had to mm-hmm. sit out and just modify, what are some tips for those listening in of re-entry? Bring it back to the basics and okay. focus on the areas that are prone to injury. So ankles, the glutes and the hips. And always remember that if you're going to do any, um, any like leg extensions or any flexibility with the hamstring, you have to warm up the low back first. I okay. don't think people remember that. I don't know if people know that. Um, so warming up the low back simply by rolling up and down, laying on your back and twisting one knee over to the side, sitting in butterfly, reaching to the side. You have to warm up that low back. Then you can warm up the hamstrings then you can warm up the hips, then you can warm up the glutes. So kind of going in a systematic order for warming up 
And then when strength training, definitely focusing on the ankles and the glutes, because without the power from the glutes and without the strength of the ankles, no one's going to stay in releve. No one's going to keep their passe high. No one's going to get off the floor with these leaps. And I'm thinking dancers don't have the space in their houses right now to be doing things full out. So those glute muscles, if they've been dormant, they could get hurt coming back down from that jump or they're not exploding properly because the glutes, that's the powerhouse. So those have to take priority. Um, So ankles and glutes for sure. Great. So to reinforce that once again, when we, when we get back to dance of when we will be crying tears of joy to be back in the classroom, it's really important to get back to basics. And especially as you said, those, the big focus on the warm ups in that progression, maybe I'll have you say that one more time so that we are real, cause this is, this is key, right? It's, it's easy to want to just go back to where we were, but it won't be that easy. No, no. So definitely start with warming up the low back. Then you can move into the hamstrings. Then you can move into the hips and the glutes. The, those areas, they, you kind of have to go in that order. And that's just like with flexibility. But then if you want to warm up, um, like physically do a dynamic warm up, something like a wall sit is going to be amazing. Every age dancer can do a wall sit. So just having your, your young, tiny ones pressing their belly button into their spine, make sure that their back is flat knees are in a 90 degree angle. Now you're working the quads, the glutes, the core, the ankles, everything. For some of your older dancers, have them start tapping their toes to the front, maybe 20 to the front, 20 to the side. And then when things get a little bit more advanced, they can actually jump off the wall. So when they're in their wall sit, pressing off their feet, hopping up into the off the floor, pointing those toes, rolling back through the feet and without their hands, working on control, coming back into that wall sit. So that's sort of the, um, the progression for wall sits. So you can start just in a simple wall sit, tapping your toes and then jumping off the wall. Very simple movement, super effective. It's going to be a really good one for warming up before you get into your class. And it's not too dangerous, but it'll warm up everything we need to get into your skills. Yeah. I mean, these are all the things, right? That we didn't ever think we had to necessarily account for, but we appreciate your expertise on that. So um, if If anyone listening to this wants to, you know, connect with you to learn more about the resource you have, where would they go? Sure. I'm most active on Instagram, which is dancer underscore fitness dot com underscore. All right. Say that one more time. Dancer underscore fitness dot com underscore. And there I have a link in my bio. And what I'm going to do is all the exercises that I chatted about here, I'm going to put a link where they can see all of those exercises with descriptions and videos. So if they're like, what was she talking about? You can just go into the link in my bio and you'll see them there. That's awesome, Katie. Well, I really appreciate your time today. I know with a, a new baby and, and, a, <laughs> and a young and a toddler, um, if it gives you any inspiration, I started dancestudioner.com when I had a two-year-old and a six-month-old and I said, you know... <laughs> the craziest ideas come to you when you're sleep deprived. Why not? And sure enough, you you know, so I'm sure that you have a a wonderful future ahead, especially the serving the needs of dance studio owners and teachers who will continue to navigate newly, um, you know, different challenges, but knowing that we've broken through learning online um, and maintaining that um, home learning is, is, Mm -hmm. is just as apparent. We don't know what the future holds, but I do hope we're all back. Um, in the traditional setting soon. But in the meantime, um, definitely go check out that resources that you mentioned. That's very generous of you. And we will definitely have you back on a future episode. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of Dance Studio 411. Visit us online at dancestudio411.com for more great resources and to submit a question for a future episode. Our number one goal is to help you build a successful dance studio business and keep your passion for dance alive.